Good evening. Thank you for coming this evening. We're going to try to make this as engaging as we possibly can. So one of the things we want to do first is introduce ourselves and the members of our school district's standards-based teaching, learning, and grading team. So my name is Hal Jones. I'm the assistant principal at South Medford High School, and I was part of this team in the early days. And, and believe it or not, we actually started thinking about this, researching best teaching, learning, and grading practices 10 years ago. Five years ago, our district implemented what we now call standards-based teaching, learning, and grading, and you could say proficiency grading practices. And so we hope this evening to kind of share with you a little more in-depth information and then answer any questions, engage you in conversation. If there are any concerns or particular questions people have, we hope that we can shed some light on some of those areas with you. I'm going to introduce my wonderful partner, Erin Beard. Hello, I am currently a teacher at South Medford High School. I'm also what's called a school improvement specialist at South Medford High School. Um, and I'm a Medford parent. So I have a middle schooler and two kids in elementary school. That was Kevin Campbell, by the way. You can get his signature later. Uh, Matt Sniffen, North High School. Oh, science, physics. I am Carla Dillon. I teach eighth grade math at Hedrick. I'm Andrea Jaime, and I teach uh, advanced social studies at South Medford High School. These brave teachers and administrators have taken this journey into standards-based teaching, learning, and grading with us over the last five years. So we're going to benefit from, from their experience. Perfect. Erin, can you walk us through why we kind of started this journey as a district? All right, so we decided to embark on this adventure uh, to make sure students get the knowledge and skills of the course content. We're wanting to make sure that all students are accountable to demonstrate proficiency in their classes. And standards-based teaching, learning, and grading is a way to help us do that. Because different students learn at different rates. So standards-based teaching, learning, and grading help helps us have a framework while also being flexible for the different needs and learning rates of our students. And learning is messy. Um, reassessment is a necessary part of the learning process. So rather than um, uh, getting stuck at, at failure, there are ways to go back, reassess, learn and grow at different rates to meet the needs of all of our students. Thank you, Erin. So one of the core questions in, in proficiency grading is this. Why do students get more than one opportunity to show proficiency, to pass in, in a subject area? Is that fair? Does that teach students the right kind of ethic in, in their work? So why do they get more than one opportunity? The consequence for students not meeting a standard is not a low grade. In other words, let's think about it like this. If I'm a high school student and I'm in uh, a math class, let's say, and I don't particularly like it, maybe I don't understand it, if I fail that, I could feel, on the one hand, off the hook. I didn't like it anyway. I'm not good at it, so I can just give up. I can stop. Now, some of you may have been wonderful students, very interested in all subjects. Raise your hand if that kind of characterizes you. Okay, believe it or not, there are students who would look at an F, a failing grade, and go, that's a relief. Now I don't have to do anything. And for them, saving face means, hey, you know what? I could have passed it if I really wanted to, but really it was just hard, and I don't, I'm not, not a math student, you know, and all that, the rationalizations that come after that, right? So here's one of the things I particularly appreciate about proficiency grading. If we think that what we have to teach students is so important, why would we not require them to learn it? That's a great question. Think about it. If we think it's so important for them to learn it, why would we not require 
that they demonstrate learning of it. Imagine in a U.S. studies class, United States history class in high school, if we're studying the Bill of Rights, what's my role, my responsibility in relationship to others in a democratic society? And I just failed that unit. Okay, we're moving on. That's the last time that student may have any exposure, any opportunity to have some kind of in-depth understanding about their responsibilities in relation to their fellow citizens. And if I don't take the opportunity to somehow engage them, re-engage, give them further opportunities to learn that content, to demonstrate some understanding of that, I think I haven't served that student well. Does that make sense? So that's really one of the, the answers to the question, why does a student have more than one opportunity? Because it's important for them to learn it. And if they didn't learn it the first time, well, as Aaron said, people learn at different times, different rates. And I gotta be honest with you, our high school students today have lots of things occurring in their lives, some of which can get in the way of our nice little timelines for their learning. And so frankly, sometimes we need to adjust to make sure that they learn and develop the skills we need. So here's some real world examples of retaking exams. Did everyone pass their driving exam the first time out? <laughs> Aaron didn't. <laughs> and yet, I gotta tell you, she's a very bright person, extremely bright. Teacher certification and licensure. Did you know that if you don't get the licensure the first time out, you can relearn, re-engage, and retest. Did you know that? It's very interesting. Lawyers, my dad, when I was growing up, decided he wanted to be an attorney. And so he took night classes, Western State University School of Law, at night. Three and a half years later, he took the California bar exam. He had a cohort of young men and women who were with him for those three and a half years, studying every night. My gosh, those constitutional law books were this thick. He took that bar exam. He passed it the first time out. His good friend, Joe, didn't. That was discouraging. But Joe buckled down. He studied and studied and studied. Next year, he took it again, and he passed it. And he's a su successful attorney. So there are lots of examples in our lives, frankly. If we think it's important enough to learn, let's give ourselves the time, the support, the energy to learn it and demonstrate that. All right, as I was just explaining through examples, learning is a process. So if we can embrace the idea of learning as a process, it's going to be normal to wrestle with skills and concepts the first time. Um, and that's, that's a shift. Um, even uh, as, as soon as 10 years ago, um, a lot of schools were not set up for looking at learning as a process. Um, there was a one and done. You get your shot, you missed it, you fail. So it's a shift of how, how do we make the, the system work to better match learning and growth? And ideally in the system, uh, students should be able to get information back from their teachers. So feedback, um, so that teachers can meet them where they are and can give feedback and even teach students how to give themselves feedback, their peers feedback, so that they can use that feedback to learn and grow. We're trying to invest, teach teachers, teach students, how to utilize the, pr the practice and feedback um, to improve the chances of learning and growth. And, and it's, it's messy and it takes time and we're still learning how to do this, but this is what we're shooting for. Taking the time to get into that messy art of learning and growth to benefit all of our students. So for retaking an assessment, there needs to be some relearning, some indication that there's that the student who needs to reassess has done some additional work to prepare for that. 
So that's super important when you think about it. What we don't want to do is create a system like a slot machine where it's just uh, by chance that somehow if I take enough of these tests and reassess and reassess, by golly, I might just pass it one of these days. So that's not what we want to do. That wouldn't reinforce the kind of work ethic, the kind of study habits that are needed to actually learn uh, the information and demonstrate the skill. So what do we want to do? What we do want to do is say, if we haven't demonstrated that we know something or can do something to adequately meet the proficiency standard, then let's get involved in some sort of learning process. So for us at schools, we call it an office hour. In addition to attending that class, we're going to go for 20 minutes before lunch to meet more one-on-one, -on -one, to get more individual assistance from a teacher so that we can master that material, we can demonstrate that skill, so that we can get to a point where the next time we, we assess, we have a much more, we would be much more likely to pass, to demonstrate proficiency. So there's, there are some conditions on this that we want you to be clear about. It's not just a matter of pulling the slot machine and hopefully one of these days I'll get familiar enough with the test and the information and by golly, I'll, I'll get a passing mark on it. No, you have to demonstrate that you're willing to work with the teacher, that you're willing to go in after regular class hours in many cases, that you're willing to sit down and, and really wrestle with those things that you might have found difficult in the past in preparing for that reassessment, and then ultimately you'll be given an opportunity uh, to reassess when in that teacher's view you're ready to do that. So the whole, the, the idea is to set that student up for a successful demonstration of knowledge and skill when they're ready. All right. So one of the adventures in figuring out standards-based teaching, learning, grading are what are reasonable boundaries. We don't want the slot machine that Hal described. We, um, I think one of the, the myths that came out when we were um, initially going down this path was that there are no deadlines. It's wide open for when students could, could do their assessments. And, and that's not true. Um, another myth that came out was that we, we don't care about deadlines, and that's not true either. So it's a delicate dance of what I, I like to call structure and soul. So we do have the structures. Deadlines are important. But we also have the soul of trying to meet the, the students' needs. And this, this it's constant dance, teachers and students, and teachers and their teaching teams to figure out that balance of structure and soul. So deadlines are important. Uh, teachers still have assessment schedules, scope and sequence, lesson plans. Um, and it's expected that, that students prepare for those assessments, come to class, participate, um, show that they're doing the practice. And, and then um, if the student is not doing practice, there are a variety of interventions that can be used to figure out, well, well why not? What's going on? Sometimes it's a can't issue. A student can't do the work and that's the teacher trying to diagnose and figure out what those can't issues are, and then figuring out how to um, perhaps get that student the, the extra support that he or she may need. Sometimes it's a won't. <laughs> I work with high schoolers, so it's very typical that it's just, no, I'm not gonna do this. And so there's the art of teaching as well, is how to motivate students, how to get them to care. Um, and, and that is a dance and can um, depend student to student on what will work. Um, and, but that's normal and that's part of the, the fantastic mess of learning and growth. So that's what teachers are, are currently engaged in. So if students aren't doing the practice, um, you can perhaps hear from your teachers that they're in trying to engage you, engage you in a partnership. Help me, you know your student best, parents and guardians, help me figure out what will help this, this can't or won't issue. And then teams, um, at South we have small schools, for example. So the small school teams are also pulling kids out of class to do quick check-ins. Hey, we notice you have low grades in XYZ class. What can we do to support you? So there are different interventions going on at different buildings to engage students in that practice, in the process of learning, so they're more likely to succeed, 
on those assessments. And some of you might know the terminology of assessments. We call the, the practice assessments formatives. Um, and then we call the, the ones where we're taking the, what can you do independently? Do you, do you have this concept? Do you have this standard? We call those summatives. So you might hear that terminology floating around. And it's practice, kind of like the uh, a sports analogy, the practice and then the game. Or my favorite analogy is in our culinary arts teacher's room. Uh, formative is when you, the cook, taste the soup. And then the summative is when your customers, your clients, taste the soup. Thank you, Erin. You know, we talked earlier about how just very simply, if we think that what we're teaching is important for students to learn, we want them to learn that not at just a minimal level, but at a maximal level. We want them not to just show proficiency, but mastery, right? All of us do. So we've set up a system in grading where if a student, let's say a student uh, studies hard, they, they give it a real earnest effort, they get to that assessment, and they fall just short of a mastery. So they're at, in our grading system, advanced which would um, be equivalent to a B in a letter grading system. But they want an opportunity to really dig down. They want an opportunity to show that they can learn more, that they understand more than that assessment revealed. Have you ever had that experience when you take a test and you go, darn, that wasn't really reflective of what I know, of my knowledge or my skill in this. It was just a... It just wasn't a good test day. I had a migraine or whatever it was. We've all struggled with that. And so wouldn't it be wonderful if we were given an opportunity, maybe through some more learning, like through office hours, and we enter into com a commitment. So it's not just a um, you know superficial thing. We're not just looking to play the odds by taking another assessment. But we say, OK, I'm willing to work more to earn the opportunity to improve that so I can demonstrate mastery with something. Yes, that's what we want to encourage, absolutely. So we have that opportunity for students. There are some conditions attached to it, and we think that those are appropriate and kind of uh, engender the right kind of commitment from students. And there's discretion that the teacher uses with that. I won't go into all that detail, but I want you to know we believe very strongly in this. Our school board does. Let's not stop with just proficiency. That's a low bar. We want to encourage each other, our students. We want to model this in our relationships as a learning community, that we're about excellence. We're about digging in and really getting to the substance of things and not being satisfied with just the surface. All right. So there's a couple of details up there. Um, that you can read about the, what exactly the math does in our grade book, um, if you are interested. Bottom line, what Hal was saying, we do want students to exceed the target, to give chances to exceed the target, not just meet, but it does require that students invest in that practice, in that process. So we are giving that opportunity, but it's, it's not free. We're working with students, like in those interventions I was describing, to come in, do that learning and growth so that they can wow us, they can exceed that target. So there's a, there's a term we use called PLC. Does anyone in our vast audience know what the, those letters stand for, PLC? She's a plant right back here. Yes. Excellent professional learning community. Now, in let's talk about a high school system, a middle school system. You know, we have, uh, let's say, in English 1, freshman English. At South High School, we have three teachers who are responsible for guiding their students through that first year freshman English. Now, some of us might assume that in a traditional... Uh, American high school system, those three English teachers would always be on the same page and always be in perfect agreement 
about what they think is most important for their students to learn and the most effective ways for them to learn. It might surprise you to know that that's not actually the case. You could go to any high school in the United States, sit down with those three same subject teachers and actually hear three very different ideas about what constitutes a high standard in their class. You could. As a matter of fact, I would predict you would because they're all different. They have different backgrounds, different ideas. They work with different students. One of the great challenges we have in public education is guaranteeing a viable, consistent, high-quality curriculum, high-quality learning experience. Have you also ever had the experience, think back, for some of us it's way back to high school, think about those teachers that you and your friends knew. Those are the teachers you wanted. Those are the classes you wanted. Why? Challenge or easy graders? Let's be honest. If I were taking an advanced math class in high school, I was not concerned about content. <laughs> I was concerned about passing. Okay? So, there can be very different standards even in the same subject area. So that's, uh, to a certain extent, that's a weakness that we had to look at. It's not okay, really, for students to go through the same course content but be held to very different standards. That's not okay. That doesn't create a guaranteed, a viable curriculum, and frankly, it doesn't adequately prepare all students, every student, for success not only through high school, but after high school. And the truth is, as public schools, we had been getting a lot of feedback from colleges over the years, the last many years, about the inadequacy of the preparation of our high school students. And we needed to take a really good, honest look at that and say, we can do a better job of being consistent, and frankly, we can do a much better job of collaborating with each other. Because by collaborating in that same subject area, getting those three English teachers together, we can share best practices, we can share best assessment, design, best ways of delivering instruction. If I'm isolated in my own room and I never talk to anybody, I don't benefit from anybody else's exploration and experience, that's incredibly limiting. And the bottom line is our kids don't benefit from that shared experience. So all classes are not the same, yet we have PLCs, professional learning communities, that work together to make sure that the standards that they share with their students are very, very similar and high. Summative assessments, these are kind of at the end of a series of learning activities. Could represent 100% of a final grade, or they could represent anywhere from 80 or 90% of a final grade. And that gets into some, some details that um, we won't get into a lot of depth in tonight. College and career readiness skills will be reflected in the report card, so people often ask this. So if they can come late to class or if you're going to separate out behaviors from academic demonstrations of knowledge and skill, where do you give feedback about their behavior, their attitude, uh, the way that they interact with each other as a classmate? Because that's important information, isn't it? It's important. We used to call that citizenship. We in our grading system said, yes, it's very important, but we need to make sure that the grade related to the learning of the content and the demonstration of the skill in the academic area is kind of not contaminated by whether or not the student was particularly nice or uh, uh, absolutely on time every single day. Other things that can sometimes influence that grade. And that's 
That's what we mean by being consistent with that standard in the grading practice. So where do we give that information? We give that information on the report card under the heading of career-related learning standards. So we try to say to the student, you know, getting to class on time, being reliable, being a person who can collaborate and cooperate with others, being respectful, considerate, having a great attitude, those are super important skills. And we're gonna give you feedback on our perception of how you're doing with that on your report card. How you do on math and the content related to that is also going to be reflected on your report card. Both are important, vitally important. And we're gonna give you feedback on both of those. All right, uh, raise your hand if you heard from your students. Uh, formatives don't count. Oh, don't worry about it, mom or dad, or teacher, or whoever. Formatives don't count. Okay, well that's not accurate. <laughs> Formatives do count. Um, some, I work with a lot of teenagers, so I'm used to the teenager, very literal brain. Um, if, a, if a teacher's uh, class setting is 100% summative, more accurately, they're saying that formative is not calculated into their grade. However, <laughs> they're probably not gonna do so well on those summatives if they haven't done the practice. And some of our teachers do have 100% summative settings. Um, more frequently, it's an 80-20 setting where 20% of the grade is the practice, the formatives, and then 80% is the, the summative, the independent work. Um, so that's one way to, with our very literal, <laughs> literal minded students to say, well, yes, it actually does impact your grade. But we also handle making the importance of practice relevant to our teenagers in, in other ways. And different teachers have different art forms of, of how they do that. I'm gonna give a shout out to Jeannie Hilton right here. She made this awesome tracker it was a chart for students of all the practice tasks that they needed to do to do the learning and the growth to succeed on the summative. So it wasn't a mystery to the students, the path Jeannie was gonna take them on for academic su success in those targets. They could self-track and connect the dots, literally, for how to sh so show meeting or exceeding the target. So it's not always in the grade book how we're, we're showing students, where it's not always on PAL how we're connecting the dots for students, but those are some of the, that's an example of a day-to-day -day way that teachers are, are trying to make that path clear, and that formatives, the practice, it does count. Um, practice, formatives, participation can look different in different classrooms. So, um, if you're having a, a, a talk with your student, um, you can be asking, hey, how'd you practice learning today? And you might ask about, well, what kind of discussions did you have? Or projects, or group work, or quizzes. Um, so practice it, it runs the full gamut of what it could be. Um, and uh, we encourage you to, to ask and help us make the emphasis that the practice is important so that they're more likely to hit or exceed the learning targets in their class. And what can we expect from our child's teachers in, in standards-based teaching and learning and proficiency grading? In this first item up here, a belief that every student can be successful. Now, when most of us look at that, we go, well, yeah, that's kind of a given, isn't it? Can I be honest with you for a second? When you really stop and think about that, it's never a given. We all have our own biases. Teaching is really, it's hard work. <laughs> and when you're working with students across a whole spectrum of life experience and exposure to learning and difficulties and all sorts of things, to, to be able to believe deeply in your soul and your heart of hearts that every single one of those students can meet the standard. Every one of those students can make it across that finish line. That requires much more than just a, you know, a little saying. It's a deep belief that has to be conveyed in our attitude and our relationship with students that they never doubt that we believe in them. Have you ever had the experience as a parent 
or as a, an older person working with young people, that they doubt themselves, right? Self-doubt. That's one of the biggest things most of us challenge with as human beings. We wonder, can I do it? All these people in this classroom, I don't know if I can do it. I start sizing myself up and compare myself with everybody else, right? Those students require that we believe in them so that they can believe in themselves, frankly, right? So we have to believe sometimes that they're capable of things that they don't even believe yet. And so proficiency grading is a grading system that adds substance to that belief. It's a system that says, when you demonstrate this, when you show me you can do this, and I'm going to help you along the way, we're going to do it. It's a very optimistic, uh, forward-thinking system. Teachers will encourage students to turn things in on time. So they're not going to, quote, get graded down like a percentage if they turn something in late, because that's a behavior. We want to give that feedback separately. But what we are going to do is pull them aside and say, Aaron, you know, I, I think the world of you, and you're super smart. Every time you turn that thing in late, it's just I get inadequate feedback about how you're doing. It's, it's sometimes it's too late, and we have this assessment coming up. And so I, the truth is I can't help you as much as I'd like to. So let's get it together, huh? Multiple check-ins regarding progress for learning. Multiple check-ins. So we don't want to let three weeks, four weeks, five weeks go by and not have any idea how each student in our class is actually doing. Have you ever had that experience? You're having this in-depth conversation with someone, you feel like they're really tracking with you, and they know exactly what you're saying, and then they ask a question and you go, you weren't listening at all to what I was saying, were you? Now, husbands and wives, we won't ask for examples. But, you know, we all have that, right? So as a teacher, we can go along and say, look, I know they're, they're tracking with me. They're looking at me. Well, I hate to break it to all of us, but people can be looking right at you and thinking about football. <laughs> thinking about, oh, that TV show I can't wait to watch when I get home. Whatever, right? So... We have to have some objective, verifiable information, feedback, coming to us regularly to know when is the right time to do that assessment. And if I don't have that feedback coming at me, then frankly, as a teacher, I'm just playing the slot machine. It's just by chance. So those formative activities, the formative assessments in preparation for that summative, in preparation for that final, you could say. That's where the real heart of this work is. It's in getting that feedback to know when most of our students have kind of shown proficiency. They can do it. Then we're ready to test. In the old days, it used to be you'd start out in September and say, you know, by October 1, we're going to have a final. Get ready. October 1, ready or not, here it is. And when 30 or 40 percent of your class fails, you go, well, you know, that's, that's on you. The truth is, people learn at different rates in different ways, different times, and a lot of variables come in and impact that. And if that's the way we approach it, we can do better. All right. So, again, I get to talk about our lovely darling students um, and how they get to engage in this process. Ideally, students are engaged in the practice and are participating in class. So that is one way to learn and grow. Um, we want students to ask questions when they don't understand. Um, so as parent, guardian, um, advocate, please encourage them. Ask us questions when they don't understand. And thanks to technology, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, I am self-proclaimed introvert. I, I would. I get really scared to go up face to face to my teacher, but we have other ways we can contact teachers. We now have uh, tools like Google Classroom that teachers use and students can contact their teachers through Google Classroom or through email. So there's lots of different ways that we can encourage our students to engage in the practice and to ask questions. 
Um, we are encouraging uh, students to uh, do that assigned practice immediately, right? That's back to, ah, it's practice, it doesn't matter. No sense of urgency. Well, yeah, it is urgent because your teacher needs to know how you're doing so that teacher can act upon that, that information from you. Uh, we don't wanna waste students' time. So we need that information to be able to accurately uh, diagnose where are students in this journey? Do I need to take a step back? Can we move forward? We, we need that feedback from students. Um, sometimes our students, they, they're pretty, pretty smart. Some figured out if I uh, just don't take the summative the first time and look at it, then I'll know it's on the test and then I'll take the retake. Well, we're working on discouraging that practice, showing us you're ready for the test the first time. Because um, there's those teenagers especially are, are tricky and they know how to, how to play the game. Well, we're trying to discourage that. Do the practice the first time. Um, and if an assessment doesn't go well, or um, not even if an assessment has failed, but if you earn less than what your goal is, then get back in there and work to, to retake, um, and, and immediately. <laughs> uh, we're trying to set some boundaries, some reasonable boundaries um, around how much time can pass before um, trying to retake, um, while also being flexible for the time you get mono or the unexpected family emergencies. So often teachers will have about two week time frames, two week windows for when uh, reassessments can occur but there's also flexibility for situations that perhaps are out of the student's control. Or if the teacher says, you know what, I see you trying, I see you engaging in the practice, so you're not quite there yet, I'll extend it longer than two weeks, but that takes communication with the teachers. Teachers are willing to do that if they can see the student engaged in the learning and growth process. So in standards-based teaching and learning and grading, it's a new system for us. We had years and years and years of this traditional, what we could call very idiosyncratic, very individual teacher-based grading system, and we've changed. It's much more standardized now, and those teachers work very closely together to determine what constitutes proficiency in their content area, and they really work to support students and hold students to those higher standards. But like any new system, there are going to be misconceptions, misunderstandings, confusions as we go through it. So here's a, a list of some top seven. Student work ethic doesn't matter because in the old system, if a student showed up for an assessment underprepared because they didn't study, they failed. Well, there's, there seems to be some justice in that. By golly, I didn't prepare, so I failed. In proficiency grading, if you didn't study and you got to that assessment and you failed, you're gonna have to study again. You're gonna have to study even harder so that you can qualify to reassess for that, but you're gonna be required to learn it. You gotta demonstrate learning on this. So failing is not letting you off the hook. So I, I would just suggest that in proficiency grading, standards-based teaching and learning, there's a higher level of work, work ethic involved. There is no out with an F. Everybody is responsible for demonstrating knowledge and skill. There is no grading policy. Well, there's actually a fairly complex grading policy. And, uh, and it's fairly standardized. So um, I think we've really worked to improve that overall. As a district, we, we have a grading policy. And believe it or not, that's relatively new. <laughs> there are no deadlines. That's the misconception. Of course there are deadlines. The thing that for a student is, if you go to that assessment, let's say it's a summative assessment and you're not prepared for whatever reason, and you take that and you don't meet proficiency, you're going to have to reassess and you're going to have to come in and work with the teacher during office hours and demonstrate that you've learned enough to uh, reassess. 
there are deadlines in the system. And, and frankly, by the end of a grading period, that's a deadline. So if you're in a semester class, you're at the end of that grading period, no more opportunities to reassess on that one. That's the end of that class. Same thing is true in a year-long class, like an English class. In June, if you haven't demonstrated proficiency in each of those areas, you're going to have to get into a credit retrieval system. So there are literal limits to it. Homework doesn't count or matter. Of course it does, and Aaron did a great job of explaining why. Students can have unlimited retakes. You know, when we first rolled this out, uh, you know, we're all very compassionate human beings and very optimistic. And we want to encourage everybody to get out there and try and try and try again. And we find that uh, we were kind of falling into that, that slot machine mentality a little bit. So we had to put some parameters, some conditions on that. And uh, we're constantly working to kind of refine and tune that system so we can be consistent with students and reinforce the idea that no, it's not just playing the odds on a retake, on a reassessment, over and over and over again. It's about de you demonstrating, you student demonstrating that you're willing to engage, to learn. And that means going to office hours. It means meeting with the teacher. It may mean having a conference with a parent and working out a study plan, whatever that means, that you're willing to engage in that, to earn that opportunity. Medford School District's assessment and grading expectations don't reflect the real world. They do. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it at that. It does reflect the real world. The real world is a world that says it's in everybody's interest that our students demonstrate a high level of learning and a high level of skill. That's the world that we want to live in. The only way to get students to do formatives is to put them in the grade book as summative. So uh, this kind of falls into the idea that the only way to do it is to somehow blend all the practice and make that compute in the end with all the, the summative work. We want, to, we want to underline for kids the importance of the practice. Of course we do. But we also want to recognize that there has to be this objective verification of what I know in the final analysis. We're all responsible for that. Right. All right, so this list we have up here, I understand you have it as a handout um, with more explanation because this is, this is a long list. Um, so you get to take that home and, and digest it at your own rate. We're hitting some of the highlights because perhaps in our, our question and answer session, you might like to go back to, to one of these misconceptions. So I'll finish out the misconception list. Um, failing grades are the only way to motivate students is a, a misconception. Um, we are trying to figure out other ways to motivate students that in the long run is healthier and more supportive of their learning and growth. And, and that process is, is messy and it takes time. Um, one of the ways is through relationship building with students. Um, one of the ways is to make the connection to what we're doing in class and how it's connected to their interests outside of class. So not just the stick, the failing grade as a motivator, but getting broader than that. And that's different for, for kids. So um, teachers are in there doing the hard work of getting to know their kids so they know how to motivate their students um, with other techniques rather than failing grades. Learning targets you might notice in PAL, if you're a PAL user, that is just the, the learning goal. PLCs, teachers working on PLC teams, work to identify what are the priority goals in this quarter. And they all work towards, towards the same goals so that each student is held to the same standard no matter which teacher they are assigned to. So it's an equity issue. We want to make sure that all teachers have a guaranteed viable curriculum. It can't be a crapshoot where the student ends up. Um, so learning targets are, the, are those goals. And teachers are working to increase their capacity of making those learning targets clear to students. Um, so, so we're working on demystifying those learning goals because when we de demystify them, we can do stuff like Genie and have students track their path to hitting that target and, 
activate the student as a learner and put it back on them, and which is going to um, have uh, amazing dividends in the long term. Okay, so we're still working on clarifying uh, the learning goals. Um, targets and objectives, I don't know if you hear that so much in, in your homes or with the students that you're working with. Um, targets are the, the broader goals and then objectives are like what people are, teachers and students are working on kind of the, the day to day. So it's really a grain size of goal. Objectives in our district is a smaller grain size and the learning target is the bigger. In high school, the learning targets are like, you cannot pass go. You cannot earn credit for this course until you show me that you've hit or exceeded the learning targets. Um, teachers have no creative freedom is a, uh, something I've, I've heard. Um, I could speak from personal experience that actually I, I feel I have plenty of creative freedom because the target is nailed down for me. I know where I'm supposed to get my students and there's a bazillion different ways I could get my students there. So even though my whole team, my whole PLC, has the same goal, we could all get to that goal in different ways. And that's pretty cool, because then in our PLC meetings, we can swap ideas. How did you get your students to succeed to get there? I was really having, a trouble, having trouble with my approach, and that's where the, the power of PLCs come in. We work smarter as a team. So there's still at least from my point of view, um, plenty of creative freedom. Proficiency doesn't work is something we, we hear. Um, it is a work in progress. We are shifting an entire paradigm. However many years public schools have, have now <laughs> been in place, we're switching from a factory-oriented model to one that better fits the world of the 21st century. That's going to take some time. So we are all still learning and growing and figuring out how to meet the needs of all of our students. The grade book doesn't work is something we hear. That's also a work in progress, shifting a paradigm to the grade books that tally all the points um, to calculate a grade. We're shifting over. On the teacher end, we see grade book. Parent guardian end, you see PAL. We're shifting over to how to communicate proficiency. And that's easier said than done, and it's still a work in progress, but that, that's our goal. How do we reflect how the students are doing in the prioritized learning goals? PAL is the only way to communicate student progress is a way, it's something I've heard um, as well. Um, it's one way. PAL is one way to communicate. So if we can empower our students to engage in communication with their, their teachers, that's another way. Um, we're using tech tools, like I, I mentioned before. Uh, parents and guardians can also be on teachers' Google Classrooms. We use other tech tools like Remind. So we have a variety of ways to communicate. PAL is one tool. No other districts are using proficiency or standards-based teaching and learning and grading is another misconception I, I've heard. Um, I know that's not true. I have worked on various projects around the state um, on the very same thing, so I know we are not alone. I don't know if anyone wants to roll out more specific statistics that we are not alone. We do know we are not alone. On your handout, we gave you some links to explore. Um, schools like um, Beaverton. Beaverton in Oregon is kind of a, a big deal. Um, it's, it's one of our high-flying districts in this state. They are also an example of standards-based teaching and learning uh, district. So at this point, we're going to conclude the presentation, and we want to thank you all for being awake and engaged. And uh, if you have any questions, we encourage you to ask us either now or directly following the presentation, and we look forward to to talking with you.